Okay. Hey. Introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Lee Sky. I'm a uh, member of the Palm Beach County Wood Turners and Vice President of the Broward Gold Coast Wood Turners and I'm a member of the Miami Club too. Uh, I'll be demonstrating at the Florida Wood Turning Symposium along with Tim this coming February and uh, I have a studio in Oakland Park. Most of you know me and seen me before. And, uh, he no longer teaches in Woodcraft. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing to Orlando. I'm doing some private lessons. They terminate. Yeah. Hey, are you doing private lessons? Yes, I am doing some. Right. Uh, I, I haven't turned the whole lot this year because my boss is in town. I'm his driver and assistant, and he's elderly, and his wife died last year, and he's in a wheelchair now, can't even stand up, and so. I, staying at his house with him and an aide for six months this year, from January to about a month ago. And I ended up, I said, I got it turn. So I took my little Carbotec lathe over there, and he's got these big wooden carts for archive boxes full of books. And I took one of those and put the lathe on top, and I wheel it out on the balcony. He's got a penthouse, the 23rd floor, on the intercoastal next to the gallery of mall in Fort Lauderdale. Okay. So I'm out there turning on my little carpet deck. I did uh, you, got, you got a dust collector? Yeah. <laughs> Called the, the wind. Is he any, he's he's any got a left on his chairs. Uh, a few. The, the balcony, the main balcony is on the north end and it wraps all the way around. So if the wind is blowing normally out of the southeast, I would put the lathe out on this corner. And all the chips would go right over into the pool next door at the hotel. <laughs> and after the winds blow on the other way, I would go on the other corner and they'd blow off that way. So I'd put a big drop cloth out and try and uh, not to shoot any chunks or something over there. The drop cloth helped any tools I drop not roll off the edge. I, I wouldn't want one to go down and spear a gardener or something. But uh, I got back in my studio about a month ago, and there about every day now, and I'm moving wood around and rearranging it. I'm thinking, damn, why do my hands hurt? I, I haven't done much in six months. I've just been hanging out with my boss. And I lost all my calluses and stuff, but they're, they're coming back fast. You're making money, huh? Yeah. yeah. Now, my demonstration today is going to be on turning a coin funnel or a coin racer. And, uh, when back when I think I was in seventh grade, living in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, we took a uh, field trip to Chicago. Went to the big museum there, and they had a, a giant funnel that went down with a hole in the bottom, and you could flip this lever, and a big steel ball would roll down and go round and round and round and round and round for several minutes before it finally dropped through, and it always intrigued me. And then I've seen some coin racer funnels at places like the Sawgrass Mall. They have one that's six feet in diameter here. There's a couple different ramps where you roll a coin down and it gets into the funnel and just starts going round and round and round. And then uh, a few years ago, when we had uh, club collaboration with uh, an experienced turner and a novice one, I was paired up with Jeff Rader, and I said, well, what do you want to make? He goes, I have no idea. And I said, well, well let's make a coin racer. And it's at Okihili Nature Center, because we made it to look like a real wishing well. And uh, they said their fundraising for the nature center went way up since we put that in there. And he said that mostly it was the park employees. They would come in for lunch, and they're, they're shooting coins down it. So uh, I decided to make a few more, and I, I looked up on the internet, you just Google coin funnel, and you get, click on images, and Google coin funnel, and you get all kinds of pictures of them up. And uh, one about three feet in diameter, I have some pictures here of them, they sell for $2,000. And I wanted to make one for myself just to get in some locations or take to some shows. Like I, I want to have this one done for the Mounts Fall Show so we can set it up and all the money can go to Mounts here. And uh, I figured I want to keep one because it's a piece I'm going to make. I'm never going to sell. It's always going to pay me. So. <laughs> hmm. 
Okay, here's some pictures of some fiberglass, commercially grade ones. And here, this is a small one that you can sit on a tabletop. I think it's only about 12 inches in diameter. But if you look at the funnels, the actual depth of the funnel from the top to the bottom, the one out at the Sawgrass Mall, I measured it. It's six feet across, and it's only 16 inches deep. So I figured, oh, cut that in half, because the one Jeff and I made, it was about 12 or 14 inches deep. And that was a pain in the butt, trying to get way down in here, because your banjo has to stop here. And your tool rest is usually only about that long. So then you gotta have whatever tool you're using extended that far of your tool rest. So if you take six foot by 16, cut that in half, three foot, that's only eight inches tall for that same exact curve. And the curve going down in can vary quite a bit. It can be wider and flatter, or like this one, how fast these around, you can see it's fairly tall and narrow. Now one of the problems we came up against was how do we make a ramp to roll the coin down? On these commercial ones, if you, you can really kind of see it in this picture, the coin kind of goes down and then the ramp turns a little to kick it down into the, the coil. And I figured if I take <clears throat> A block of wood, I figured it'd have to be strong too because kids are going to be pulling on it and stuff like that and I didn't want it to break. So I figured if I take a nice chunk of wood and run it, I cut about 22 and a half angle there and I ran it onto the table saw blade. And when you do that, it gives you a straight line and then you hit the curve of the blade. And and when you roll the coin down, it shoom, kicks it out sideways. If this was a little deeper, this curve would come around even more. Now, and to do that safely, <laughs> it's pretty scary. You wear, you wear glasses, right? Uh, <laughs> you wear a nut cup and a, a full face shield <laughs> and an apron. Now, to do it safely, you really need to make a slide to go on your table saw. Just a board flat this way and a board up or you can put this up against and clamp it to that. And you're holding this, it's clamped to the slide, and you're moving this whole sliding table onto it. You do a shallow cut, maybe a half inch, crank the blade taller, do another half inch cut, crank the blade taller. You don't try and go up two inches into that in one shot. You, you, you just have to uh, do it in stages. Now there are other ways to make ramps which some of them I haven't quite figured out yet, but I'm going to. And I know some of you geniuses in the room can figure that. Okay, let's pass these around. Now, they say art, the greatest form of flattery in art is when people are involved in it. So, we set this up in order for you to experience art, you need to be involved in it. So, get, get all your change out of your pocket and bring it up here, <laughs> and we're going to roll it down. Now, what rolls the best is those gold coolants. <laughs> That's the best kind of coin, it really goes. Especially if you have to keep it a lot. Yeah. Now, I have two coin funnels here that aren't done. I don't have a base made for them yet. This one I just I figured, oh, that fits in there. You know, that can be used for a catch. The base we made up there, we just took a piece of plywood, got a circle in it that fit the rim. Because I wanted to keep the natural edge of the wood around showing. On this one, I turned a little lip here so I could sink it into the base. I'm probably going to turn, make a big plywood disc, and turn maybe two inch thick rings of wood and then just stack them all up. So this thing sits up about that high. It's going to be some gluing up and uh, that kind of thing. Once I cut a bigger log and just slice it and then cut rings out of that, but uh, I'll have to figure out how that works. Now after I made the funnel, 
we had to figure out the right height for the ramp. So we made one about this tall first, and it was just too tall. The coin went too fast, and it just was shooting off the, the edge of the ramp. So I'll put this around over here. What I did was we made the ramp and kept cutting it shorter and shorter. So I think the one at Okahili was like five inches tall. And that works for that one. But if you run it over here, see the coin's going to go off the side. So who gets the money if he does that? Well, <laughs> whoever cleans I, up. I do. <laughs> yeah, who's on cleanup? This one I actually cut this bottom edge a little bit of an angle so it, it leans over. If you want it to kind of lean over to sit there, I might even carve this a little to conform to the shape of the wood. This is just a sample to show the cut, but I would actually use something a little heavier like this and make it a little more interesting. So if I put this here and just angle it, and I try and find the right spot where it's not going to drop down too fast and not going to... And when they get down to the bottom, they really start winding around each other. And most of the ones in those pictures, they have a ramp going to the left and one to the right. So they're, they're going like that, which really makes it interesting. Now what you want to do when you make one, you want the curve to start down right away. If you make it too flat out here, the coin's just going to shoot off and see what happens. Now the size of the hole in the bottom, I figured like a silver dollar, I mean a 50 cent piece, like you know, Kennedy one is about the biggest coin that we have that somebody might roll down there. <laughs> so I forget the measurement, I don't know if it was an inch and uh, three eighths or an inch and a half the hole. Now I thought of a, an alternate base one. If you're making a smaller one, you could just come down and then turn another piece down and around like that. So you basically have a base. And that can be your catch basin too. Now those commercially graded ones, they say they weigh 192 pounds. That, so nobody can really pick them up. But if, if the catch basin gets too full, how many people have collected coins and had one of those big, big bottles full? They, they weigh a ton. So. In the articles, do they say what the curve should be, like a parabola? Or? No, but looking at the pictures, there's that one that's really tall and skinny, and it has a really tall ramp. So it says that those coins go a couple minutes. The one we made at Okahili, some of the coins would spin for 20 seconds. And this one, it only goes for about 10 seconds. <coughs> Which is good, that means they have to keep doing it. Yeah. Now, I'll pass this around. <laughs> <laughs> and this piece of wood is actually monkey puzzle tree. It looks like a Norfolk. It actually came here from Mount Botanical Gardens. They had a big one that died, and they cut it down. And <laughs> Yeah, well, that was, yeah, right over there, somewhere. When I got here, it was in the parking lot in pieces, so I took the biggest chunk to make one of these. Greedy bastard. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can share in it. You got any change? <laughs> Remember, those gold cool grass. They're, they're good. Okay, I'm going to make one out of this uh, piece of mahogany. Now that one, I turned on my 20 inch Powermatic for the head slides. I, I mounted the face plate on the bottom. I have a power planer and I wanted the face plate to sit really good. So I took the power planer and just really worked the center until I got the size of the face plate perfectly flat. Because the more contact, the stronger the hold is. When you're, when you're putting screws, in there, you want that sitting as flat as possible, especially for something that size. How much did it weigh, Lee? Uh, 150 pounds? Uh, probably 200 or more. It was wet. Did when you I... have to uh, weight the other end of the leg? Uh, no, 
I didn't, but I did put some stuff on there just for extra. <laughs> because it, it was about this close to the end of my lathe. I, I run the headstock back just so there's just enough to turn. And uh, that's actually 32 inches across. And I have an 18 inch bed extension that can go on the end of my lathe, but I, I mounted it on a steel plate so it sits really low. That way I could have the banjo out here. I actually had the banjo up here till, till I turned enough of this out where I could put the banjo down below. And then I was... Did you turn it down? Did you slide the head back far to the back? Yeah, I, I slid it back further. Just Then I could put the banjo on this side, put my tool rest over here and kind of work in here. Now one problem I had with that was Hollowing it out, I could do some, but I was getting a lot of vibration still. And I just did what I could, but then when I got down to what I wanted to finish surface, I wanted to cut cleanly. And since this is in grain, instead of cutting from here in, you really need to cut from the center out. That's cutting with the grain. And no matter what I did, what tool I used, it was getting vibration. And uh, I think some of you saw those pictures I sent when I had those uh, eight, nine foot long beams I was turning. I borrowed my buddy's Powermatic bed. I left the headstock at his house and the tailstock. I took his banjo. The two of us could be turning on those long beams. And when I was done with that, I put, I separated the two beds and I put this on my headstock and had his tailstock over here. Because I still had the center post out and that strengthened it enough so I could cut about all the way down this much and come up and clean all that up. And then I took the center out and moved the lathe and just did it that way. Is your lathe bolted to the floor? No. A powermatic weighs 650 pounds. Plus the dirt and the finish, I got stuck to it. Probably adds five pounds. <laughs> now, but before I start, I want to show you something I came up with. It's probably been done before, but I've never seen it. But when I was up at the penthouse, turning on the balcony, I thought, I need a damn grinder. So, I was the first couple times I ran over to my studio, resharpened the tools and came back, or I was sharpening them with the diamond hone, and I thought, there's gotta be a way to mount a grinding wheel on the lathe. So, I had a, uh, more taper thing where with the rod and I was trying to hook it up that way and it worked. But then you got to bang this and get it out. So I thought, face plate. Most of us have these face plates that come with the lathe sitting in a drawer that we never use, right? So I thought if I take and mount a block of wood on there, turn a tenon, that The grinding wheel will fit on. Then I marked on here. I, I did a mark. Put a tail here with the mark. Head here with the mark. I'm just going to line up this mark with that. Now this face plate goes on this lathe the same er and stops the same place every single time. This was on. I did this one on the Jet Mini lathe in my studio. So this may wobble a little, maybe different. I turned it on, it looked to be running pretty true. I'm just going to line up the lines here. And on this side, I made a line too. And this is just held in place by the center. The one I made for my Carbotec, it was a smaller wheel, because the Carbotec, only, I can only turn six inches in diameter. So I actually epoxied the wheel to both pieces of wood. But this way, I figured, I can take this off, put it back in the box, and the wheel's protected. I'm not working, I'm worried about trying to get this thing unscrewed. See, okay, now this one's even big enough for the banjo. On the 10 inch lathe, there's not much room between this 8 inch wheel and the bed of the lathe, it's only an inch. So on this lathe, you could even make a plate for the, the grinding jig to go under here. 
or you can home make your own. Now what do we have here? We have a multi-speed grinder. And if I just use my tool rest, now I want to put a rag or something down here just to keep the grit from getting on the ways of the lathe. I don't want to be running that over. And you can adjust the height of the tool rest. I haven't made a, a flat plate that I want to put on here like the regular grinders have. I've been doing other things. See, now we can just If that's too slow, I just speed it up a little bit. We can uh, <coughs> I can just sharpen my gouge on here. Instant grinder. So for some of you who are limited on space, this is another alternative. But it's plus for doing demonstrations. I cannot always take a grinder with me now. Anybody think that's a good idea? Now, uh, uh, that's it. I was just trying to figure out a way I could make money on it. So. Forget it. Forget it. Hey, hey, wood turners are cheap. I know. Other, other. What's that? Other wood turners. Other wood turners. Not, not Palm Beach. And I drilled a hole in this block of wood so I could get the faceplate screwed off. I also drilled one in the faceplate because this is a real thick faceplate. not to bring a grinder in because I sharpened my tools before I came. And if you made a, a block of wood, like had the one-way very grind jig, not the very grind, but the wool brain system, you could just make it fit here, put it on there, make you some kind of screw lockdown. You have your long jaw bar, you have the other piece, and go to town. If you have a bigger lathe, you can build this block up higher so that it's at the right height. Not that hard to do. Can you buy that for Wolverine? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can buy just those pieces. The red blades? Yeah. Well, I bought a new one, and I only have one grinding wheel, and I sold that one and the long, extra long bar I had to somebody. Okay. Well, you can make one for each lathe you got. Yeah. Now... To make our coin racer, I'm making it out of a solid piece of wood. But you can, slow this down, you can make it out of segmenting, which I'm going to do too. I want to make a big one with segmented rings and uh, either make another one out of wood like this or the segmented one and get it to the AAW gallery in Minneapolis as a permanent part of their collection. You know, right inside the door or by their cashier's table, where you can put that. And they, they can raise a lot of money that way for the educational fund. Now, somebody brought in a pile of old fine woodworking magazines and there was a guy in here doing segmented turning and I thought, damn, that looks almost exactly like this coin racer. And he's just making big bowls. But the wood he's using is either MDF or alder or some, some kind of wood in his area, which a cabinet in a mill shop throws away, extra pieces. And he just says he joints them and planes them to make them true and then he cuts them on 45 degree angles. Can you, can you see real good on the yeah, TV? Yeah. Now he does the 45 degree angles instead of 
like most octagon frames you see, they do 22 and a half degree cuts. But if you did a 22 and a half, you'd have a, a seam right here, right here, right here. All the seams would be directly in line. Cutting the edges at 45 and gluing them together like this, all the joins are automatically stair-stepped off, which makes the whole thing stronger. And here he shows he's gluing them together on a metal table, but he's using hot melt glue to glue the segments together. But then when he stacks them up, he uses the yellow wood glue and clamps them when he stacks them up to make the shape. Now, when you do it this way, it's side green versus out of a log or a tree, that's end green. So if you make one side green, you cut from here in. That's following the grain of the wood. It's, it's a little bit easier to do. I made a couple uh, samples of doing that. These are different size wood. Uh, bottom, like six stacks, he uses exactly the same size. And then the, the higher up the funnel you go, the wider your wood needs to be, because it's angling out. The, the sections up here need to be wider. Like maybe here, up at the top, and maybe this wide in the middle section, and then you have narrower ones in the base. And he said when you stack them up, you need to have at least a half inch overlap for strength, for what he was doing. I want this thing to be thick, because it's something that's going to be used there's going to be people leaning on it, looking at it, and kids pulling on it, so that's why I, I left this one really thick. Plus, if you make it this way, you don't really even have to cut this bottom side. You can leave all these sections showing underneath stacked up like that. It might look real good, but if you're going to make some kind of base that covers it, you don't even have to cut this section. Well, it's a lot of work gluing up all these rings and stuff, but you can also use different colors of wood and create patterns that kind of spiral down into there or whatever you want to do. I would say maybe use a, a lighter wood, but this rosewood one is real dark, so the color of the wood wouldn't really make that much difference. So let's, let's pass these around. Here's a, a few pictures I copied out of there. Don't, don't turn me in for copyright infringement, please. And it just shows the different uh, stack ups that were going on and uh, how to cut. And, and at this portion, he actually, he'll like glue several layers together and then do some more and then glue those two. Two or three stacks. Yes, sir. So, do you think that, that hot melt glue is, is what you really want to use on something like this? Well, that was just like an octagon ring. That was just to glue that. But when he stacked them up, he used tight bond glue, the yellow glue, when he yeah. stacked all the rings together. The end grain. Glue, glue. Yeah, when you glue end grain to end grain, it's not, that, or even end grain to side grain, it's not that strong. So, hot melt glue just keeps it in shape. Yeah. Then, when you glue it in the stack, you glue the side grain to side grain. And the joints are offset. That that makes it a solid piece of wood. You did the same thing with super glue. You could use the, the use the glue yeah. as a clamp to hold the piece together for the other glue to set. Yeah, it's yeah, more expensive and more prone to gluing yourself to your work. <laughs> but, yeah. Is it possible to make? Let's, let's say you left it the way it's going to have that cigarette set thing on the inside as well, and then just like. Uh, you probably could do that, but it's a little more work than I want to try and figure out. Uh, I got a lot of things on my list to make. I'm just going to do a big, that would be kind of a neat thing. You could, you could make something like that to run marbles down too. Doesn't have to be coins. We can go down the little one. Yeah. When it leaves the little one, go through the big one. So what you gotta do is get a cap and then you gotta group all the way to the top. <laughs>
Most of us have lost our marbles, so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and none of us have any coins. <laughs> well, you can, you can, oh, I only got a $100 bill. I've seen people put dollar bills down through the hole just to make a donation, too. <laughs> hey, Lee, tell us how long you're going to leave that leather vest on with, with the temperature in here. I have my own fan over here. Uh, this, this piece of wood is mahogany. Uh, Linda Zach, who was teaching carving at Woodcraft, had several logs in her garage for about eight years. And she said, I'm cleaning it out. Can I bring them over? And I said, sure. Any, uh, want to tell us about the consideration for screws in a face plate for end grain versus side grain? Excellent. Especially a heavy piece. Huh? Yeah. That's a good point. Uh, <clears throat> getting the screws in the face plate. This piece I'm making is end grain. So, the fibers of the wood go in this direction. If we're doing side grain and screwing the plate to side grain, you, you can use shorter screws because the screw goes in and it grabs the sides of the fibers and holds really strong. This way, the screw's going in here, kind of pushing the fibers out of the way. So you need more screws and longer screws. This is going to be the top of my funnel. I want to do the bottom first and make the bottom hole. The first thing I want to do is uh, make a flat spot to screw this face plate on and then go in and make my bottom hole in about two inches and get that done. I'm going to drill a hole a little deeper through there. So, but I want to get this little bottom bit in here done. So when I'm coming from the top hollowing, that's already there and I don't have to go in so deep to try and refine it. Lee? Yeah. For your bottom hole, is there a formula to figure out how long you want that hole to be? I mean, does it come down and... Well, I just wanted it to be at the bottom of the curve and then undercut it a little bit. Okay. Just so it's not visible, a sharp edge. Plus, if any kids stick their fingers down in there. No, they won't. They went for cougar in. Yeah, about uh, five years ago. Yeah. The hole has to be small enough so no kid can reach down there and grab a handful of pennies, but then he can't get his fish. <laughs> like that little girl who uh, climbed up in the toy machine at one time. <laughs> now I just want to uh, chew up the outside a little so it theoretically stops vibrating. Uh, the mahogany bugs me a little bit, so I want to wear my dust hat. I recommend everybody wear a dust mask every time you're turning, not just when you're sanding. Even on Wednesday nights at Tim. Okay, I'm just going to chew this up first to make it stop wobbling. Plus, I'm going to get some of this wood out of the way, get the curve going. That, that'll make it lighter for when I'm on the other side. For that, I think I'll just use a bowl gouge. And again, even though it's screwed securely to a face plate, I'm using the tailstock. It helps quell the vibrations and it just makes it safer. And new people, every time you're turning, use the tailstock as much as you can until it's in your way until you start hollowing, then you take it away. But otherwise, put it up there. That's why I went to the bowl gap. 
cover me with chips. Leave, put the paint on the other side, you're getting it. Well, no. Oh, see, I'm getting a few. Now, if you, I don't know how close the camera is, but they, they talk about rubbing the bevel when you're using a gouge. Now, there's two spots on using this gouge you need to rub the bevel. On the point here, where it's touching the wood that way, but on the side, also, where your tool's cutting. If you have the point bevel touching, but then the tool rolled over, underneath here, the actual cutting edge is not on the bevel. It dulls the tool quicker, and it kind of grabs and digs in more. So, see right there, it's on the front bevel, and then I roll it to the side, now it's on the side bevel. Listen to that cut. Now if I lift it a little bit more, it's no longer on the side bevel where it's cutting. Can you hear the difference in the cut there? Up here, right on the bevel. Get that, turn it in. Okay, if I turn it back just to here, it quits cutting. Turn it in, that's the bevel. I see a lot of people turning the tool over this way thinking, I'm rubbing the bevel, but cutting edge is not on the bevel. It's just a little subtlety that makes the big difference. And this is with your spindle gouge also, not just the bowl gouge. It's okay. okay, and your experience. But beginners, you should always shut it off, wait till it stops, and then move it around. This is moving nice and smooth, and I know I can control it. On my Powermatic, it's sticking a little bit, so I shut it off because I'll be on, and I'll jam it into my work and damage it. but it's better if they see how this... See, now, now this is really loud. So at this point, especially when I'm hollowing, I would also put the ear protectors on. Because especially when you're hollowing, that was like a damn loudspeaker coming out. But just cutting this, this is very dry mahogany. It, it's pretty loud. Well, can't these guys just take their hearing aids out and accomplish the same thing? <laughs> well, some of them got them super glued in from squeezing a bottle and listening to the ear. <laughs> now I wanted to leave that bigger to fit the face plate, but I didn't do that. So So it's gonna have to fit in the chuck? Shorten it up. Yeah, I can shorten it up, right? This is just for demonstration. Well let's see where it is. Well you don't have to have the whole width if you lighten it up enough. Well, it, it helps to center it. You didn't have a hole in it anyway. Yeah, but I wanted to make the outside the exact size of the faceplate. So that way I could get it pretty much exactly set. So if you make the outside of the set one set of screws. No, no, no. Well, we'll work it out. Try that. Lee, if you measure one set of screw holes, you can line up with the screw holes. I drilled some of those holes in there and they're not perfectly lined up. So. Oh, you added it. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Lee says use a lot of screws. Many face plates only come with maybe six holes in it, so he made additional holes. 
you know, like this base plate only had four screw holes, and I added four more. Because I knew I was going into in grain on that. And, and if you do make one of these, do not make that be side grain. In grain only. Is it, this could break off real easy. In grain, it won't break. But actually, if you want to do that, you can buy a thick dowel that's in grain, in side grain. Oh, yeah. Oh, you can do that as well. And there's always a way. up on the outside here. I just want to finish chewing this up and get the sharp corners off. As these edges here get real sharp. I was turning the piece last Sunday or the Sunday before and I went like that and it cut me about two inches long on the palm of my hand here. It wasn't really deep, it was just like a real bad paper cut. So, I like to round those corners off to the safer. Okay, we'll stick with that for the outside. Now this surface I want to chew up and make it flat. You see right now it's bouncing a little bit. take any straight tool I have and check it. It's still a little high in the middle. Must be a wood spider. Yeah. Now it's a little bit undercut. This whole center section is pretty much flat, but there's a high spot out here. And that's okay too on a small piece like this. But on something larger, because you at least want the face plate secured on this outside rim. It's better if the whole thing is flat, but uh, for this piece it's probably okay because it's not that big. The other face plate, maybe, didn't you? Oh, yeah. See, that's pretty much absolutely flat all the way across now. Okay, I want to undercut this part a little bit more, just taking advantage of the tail stock. All right, now I want to drill a hole through here. I'm just going to start it with the Jacobs chuck. You see this cap on the Jacobs chuck? It may be too long. But I can see. Perfect fit. Now instead of pushing this up and locking it and then turning it on, there's a lot of lathes, especially with this long, there's a little bit of play in here. If I turn it on first and then push it up, this is going to center itself and then lock it. See that just went through, now I lock it. 
and your hole starts a little truer. Now on a wood like mahogany, it's usually soft enough for me just to leave this unlocked and push it in. And but I'm holding this to make sure it doesn't catch and spin. Now if you're ever doing this and the Jacob's chuck becomes loose, push it in, do not pull it out. I had a buddy do that, and he pulled it out, and this thing's flying around. He had a drill bit that long in it, though. And it's banging around, and I, I was close, and I jumped and hit that off, but it bent the drill bit over about 90 degrees. Now, if you wanted to, you could put a bigger Forstner bit in and make your hole that way. Okay, now I want to widen the hole up as much as I can. You can there's a variety of tools you can use. You can use a round nose scraper like this. You can use a spindle gouge with that back cut method. I like to use this drill bit, which I modified and turned that into a cutting edge, and it cuts like a gouge. I like using that a lot. I'm just going to start off with this round nose scraper. The tool rest is a little bit high. I want it about right there. Remember, scrapers always angle down a little bit. Gouges up, scrapers down. Uh, then you don't get catches. Now, being it's a scraper, I want to speed the lathe up a little because scrapers cut better with the lathe running faster. I just want to make sure this is tight on here. They won't come off, so. But sometimes if one tool vibrates, try a different one. I'm going to use the drill bit. Helps if you tighten all the levers. out calipers which open up that way or a, even a flat piece of wood or a piece of cardstock cut to the diameter I want just to make sure the hole is the right size. You can also just take a big coin like the biggest one you got like uh, the old 50 cent pieces and just see if that's big enough for it to fit through. Anybody have any of the gold cougar ends I could try? Now 
Now I flared the bottom out a little bit. to get my final surface down in this portion because I don't want to be trying to mess with that from the inside. All right, at this portion I would actually sand that bit, but we're not going to do that. Okay, now I need to put the face plate on this end.
What are we talking about? She asked if anybody joined the club that has never done a turn before. I said most of them have joined the club. Yeah, most of them. They have never turned before. Then I said there's people have been doing it for years and I don't know how to do it. <laughs> like you joined the club and never came to the meeting. That's it. What's <laughs> up today? picked up a bunch of Norfolk, well, at the end of last year, that's at least as big as this, that big coin laser. I want to make a few more of these. You don't think it's dried out right now? Uh, not completely. <laughs> so, if anybody wants to come over and experience turning something big and help me rough it out, that would be great. You can even roll the first coin down. Now this will probably produce some vibration. Now, the first thing I want to do is bore a center hole. This time I'll use a gouge. Well, it's yeah, probably that's off. That's a good point. It is off. It's off by about a half an inch. Well, first, let's turn the speed down. See, and that's why I try and leave, uh, at least do pencil marks like I did on this side, the pencil mark, to know where that face plate is. I might do two or three, and then I can center that face plate even more. See now the outside's off. Are you gonna throw your whole long piece at the bottom? Or are you gonna have to chew it up some more? Well yeah, the hole will be off, but that's something that can be blended together sanding. I, I will chew it up a little bit. Just to the visible part. You know, I'm gonna do this without the tail stock up so you can see the difference in the vibration. Also doing light cuts too. need to take any more off on the outside. Now to drill a hole with the spindle gouge, I need to find the dead center, which sometimes if I can't see it well when it's spinning, I turn the light on. <laughs> or have someone do it for you. Or have somebody, but I, I put a pencil mark there. That tells me where the center is. Now, the point of the tool needs to be exactly on dead center, and your tool needs to be level. If it's too high, the tool just won't go in. It'll go in a little bit and stop. If it's too low, it'll go in, but it's going to be bobbling and jumping around. So, see that tool rest is a little low, so it needs to come up some. Put that right back on center. I'm just looking at the bed of the lathe and the tool. Check it once more. 
That looks pretty good. Now you need to be dead on center. If you're a little to the left, that point is going to grab and kind of skitch you up the side. But you need to get there and get it in. And you want your arm against your body, not out here like that. You want it in tight, go in and out with your body. And you got to get it in and get it out. Don't leave it in there. So where it's heating up and getting hot. So once it's in, it stays in. And then when you put the tool back in, favor the right side of the hole. You hit the left side, especially if it's going a little faster, it'll really grab your tool. So favor the right, get it in, push it in and out. And then once you're getting in there, you can tell if it's just a tiny bit high because it'll kind of stop going in. And if it's too low, your tool's going to be bouncing around like that. I'm going to widen the outside hole a little bit. Go in deeper. There, I just hit the hole inside, but you can tell it's off. Now this is going to be really hot, so either cool it off or use another tool. Now, in grain, remember we cut from left to the center out. If this is side grain, you cut from the outside towards the center. Now instead of doing the whole thing, because you can hear there's vibration, I'm going to put the, the live center back up. And that will support this while I can cut away a lot of this mass out of the side instead of trying to do that all with the vibrating. If you're getting that kind of vibration and you have it in a chuck, sometimes that can compress the wood and become loose in the chuck. See, now it's supported. You can put that back. I'm actually going to go with the gouge to start off. Screw it up first. Now I can run the speed up a little bit more too, since I'm supported. Wrong way. Now I'm kind of cutting against the grain, which for my finished surface I don't really want to do. But maybe I'll come in here and I got a starting place. Now this surface is actually tilted a little bit to the that way, which now if I'm cutting in that direction, I'm cutting uphill or downhill. I'm following the grain of the wood. Ideally, I would start this 
with a wet log. It's so much nicer cutting. This is a very dry piece. And it's really dusty and crumbly. Hope I got some lemon juice in there. The mahogany turns me real purple, especially when you're sweating a little bit. And lemon juice takes it right off. You can wash your hands six times, it's still going to be purple. So, I'm sure we can find a lemon on the premises. Yeah, right. I had some little packets in there, I think I got one left. you're having a problem with tool control, if you'll notice, that tool is always up against me, either with my arm or my hand, and I'm using my body. If you're out here just trying to do it with your arm, that can create problems. to drill that hole through the center on this end. I thought I might be able to just go ahead and hollow it, but this wood is so dry, it's creating a big problem with vibration. So just putting the center up to the solid piece of wood instead of taking the time drilling that hole is probably what I would do. Because I can, I'll get into the other hole when I get a little deeper. in a scraping mode and this surface here has to be 90 degrees or less when it touches that wood. You get up that way that's where catches occur but over here it's real safe. Same on this side. If that top edge on the bowl gouge is about an eighth inch away it's real safe. If I get up about a quarter inch away that edge is presented at such an angle. Scraping, it scrapes. You get too high up and it wants to dig in like that. So you either be on the bevel or completely in a scraping mode. getting some kind of bouncing and bump stop and look we got uh, that dead knot that was on the bottom looks like it came all the way up here if you got some other kind of knots this might be in grain but the knots are side grain and it might create a problem with one tool then you might have to switch to another tool switch to a hollowing tool just because I love this tool. This one actually comes with a, uh, a spring which is your depth gauge. You set the distance between there and whatever part of the edge you're cutting on. If you're cutting over here, you'd want to set it over here to your thickness. If you're cutting off the point, you set it there. If you're cutting off that end, you set it over here. You tighten that down and then you just go to town and real fast. This is great for making salad bowls too. I'm not going to need this because this is just going to stay thick and I'm just concerned about my inner profile. You uh, still make those? Uh, I don't sure. make these but my buddy Paul, he makes this one here with the spring and the handle. 
He's out in Seattle. He's in several woodcraft stores, Packard catalogs, picking him up, and uh, probably craft supply too. I know. They're on the market. I have all five different sizes he makes, from 3 8 diameter. This is the 3 quarter inch. He makes a big 1 inch one, it's about that tall. And he just upgraded his production, so prices came down about 40%. Now this is a scraper. So I don't want it angled up, I want it angled down just slightly. Whoop. I let it get off the end. Yeah, this is only a 10 inch tool rash. You should have at least a 12 inch. The 12's right there. Well, I can hold it like that, too. That tool is particularly good for hollowing through a, a smaller opening. You sure that's a 12? That's nine and a half inches. This is a 10 inch rash. Yeah. Well, you know. Well, it's a, he always brags. That's a quarter inch. <laughs> couple inches. Couple inches short there. That's eight inches. Yeah. <laughs> Couple inches short there. Couple inches short there. I just have to pay attention to the end. So. Now I'm also trying to eyeball the profile I want to curve down into that hole. I'm trying to imagine that hole, which is about this size here. So, or about like that. That's the hole on the bottom. So I'm trying to gauge the height of this and the angle so I have a nice smooth curve down. I'm leaving a little wood here once I get to the hole to refine the inner shape. Because what we want is this one nice fluid curve all the way down. Now this big one doesn't have that. Good chip catcher. Right in this portion here, it actually dips down that way. Because, uh, and it, it, you saw the coins roll, it doesn't really affect it. As I took a flat thing, this is a nice curve right here. It actually flattens and dips down and then a nice curve. But it doesn't really affect how it works. It just, I can kind of see it though, and it, if it has a nice smooth curve, one shot, it looks better. <coughs> I have a, a drawing and kind of a write up on this, and I couldn't. It's got that curve and shows it really well, but I couldn't find it to bring it here. That's uh, high speed steel. Do you turn that around sometimes to use it as a scraper Yeah. This, the edge here, there's a small point for fast hollowing, and then you got this curve here for some more hollowing, and then this long, gentle curve for final smoothing up. But this tool is, you can literally control it by a finger or two. I like to just hold it here and go back and forth. You can put your arm across it if you're doing some really heavy, hard hollowing. But uh, this is my favorite hollowing tool. I mean, I don't have to set up the big backrest like on the Jameson system. But that's actually a little safer than this one is. Especially if your tool rest is too short. And a long handle is good. Yeah. And again, you want it 
next to you. You don't want to be doing it out here like this. Unless you're following the rule and experienced. Up against your body, see my arms on top of the handle. If I get a catch, it's got to pick me up. If my arm's out here, it gets a catch. Wham, that comes up. You're not going to be able to hold it down. That happened to Mitch Wallach once at the big steel bar. He was turning up. He had a 500 pound log on his big nickels lathe, and he got a catch and that boring bar came up and cracked him right here. And he woke up and the lathe was running and he, he didn't know how long he'd been on the floor. Five-eighths size, where there's just a little bit less distance there. I'll just switch over to my round nose paper. Now, once I start getting further over the tool rest, I can actually run it inside so I'm not so far over. I should start be getting close to that hole down there. Well, maybe not yet, but... But once you get to that hole, then that piece is going to fall out. Well, the hole's off center, so a piece of it will open up first. Yeah. yeah. Right. But if I know I'm getting close... That's, that's a good reason to have it If I would have measured the inside and put a mark out here, I would have known how deep I was. I could go, okay, that deep. I'm, I got another half inch before I hit the hole. It's just a gauge, a safety gauge, so I know when I'm getting close. Now this looks like it's, I need more, just eyeballing this curve. If my hole is about that diameter, I'm almost there. So I got to remove some more of this stuff here. again cutting against the grain. Check everything again. Cutting against the grain does not cut the wood as clean and it dulls your tool about ten times faster than cutting with the grain. That's that knot that was in there.
Yes, sir. Uh, about eight or ten minutes. Okay. Now I might be able to come into here. And measure. I know that hole is not that deep. You don't think? But that's what this says. It's, it says that you got to Why would it line it out? <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to try and feel it to the side and hit the edge of it. Because I did drill all the way through the other hole, didn't I? You cut it in the face, but. <clears throat> well, if I didn't drill that hole, I could stop it there and go. Okay, it's right here. These make real good depth cages. Just put a put a piece of wood, run it through, and you can put it in, stop, bring it on the outside, go, okay, I'm almost to the bottom of my face, a bowl. Well before you throw out an old radio, take that antenna off. Or an old radio. Pardon me, what's a radio? <laughs> what's a radio? <laughs> it's a TV without a picture. Or or the old cell phone boxes, because they have a little one, and that one folds up about that short, so you can use it on shorter pieces. Or if you have one of those old, uh, what I have is That little grab I just had, if my arm wasn't up against me like this, if it was out here, it really would have went and dug down in there. So keep it up against your body. Now I want to get rid of the centerpiece. Tail stock. So I want to wear it down a little bit first. I'll get there. I wasn't going to cut it all the way off. Boots. I'm used to the demonstrator syndrome. Right? Whatever you need. You don't think the same when you're demonstrating it when you're in your own shop. I know. Right <laughs> okay, now I have my center hole to go by. So I want to switch back over to this. Now I know I'm not cutting to the left of that hole, so I don't need the tourist out that way. Not just hollow forms with a small hole. Even the uh, end grain salad bowl? Yeah. Keep it on the tool list.
Okay, now since the uh, bottom hole's off center because I didn't cut this large enough to measure and then get that face faceplate on there straight, it's off a little bit inside there. But that's basically what I want to do. Now I have a lot of wood left that I can refine the shape a little bit. It's not done, is it? You only got two and a half minutes according to your schedule. Okay. <laughs> He just looks worse because of these high def televisions. So, anybody have an analog that we can get for the club? I make a motion, we buy analog TVs. <laughs> I don't know if we can find them anymore. You can still buy eight track players at the swap shop. You know, it, right in this area, it was a very slight curve, but it was kind of flat, so. I want to smooth out down here, get rid of that tear out, and up here, flare it out a little more. And now I'm just trying to cut with the grain coming out, instead of cutting on the way in. vibrating quite a bit because of the the length out from there plus we have no tail stock support in a case like this I would probably shut it off spray it wet with water resharpen the tool Make sure everything here is tight, like maybe retighten the screws, see if anything's loosened up. We're getting a lot of ridges because of the vibration. That's why we try and do it while the support is still there. Plus, if this base would have been bigger, and maybe a heavier face plate would have been good too. And a heavier lathe also. You brought me a bad lathe. I told you I wanted to power medic. <laughs> And then if that doesn't work, I might try a sharp gouge going against the grain. That may eliminate these ripple cuts so I can just sand it the rest of the way. If, if the ball gouge didn't work, the spindle gouge might work. A very fine cut. Yeah, very shallow, slow cut. magazine article, that bowl that that guy was turning was about that big and he said he turns them up to 36 inches in diameter. And he, he's cutting them down from the one that in that page it looked like it was a quarter inch thick or three eighths inches. So he has to have very good tool control in order to cut that cleanly. See now, that's cleaning this up. There's some deep gouges from the vibrations. And I could come across and do this maybe six more passes and get all these vibration scraper marks out of there. The spindle gouge is cutting it pretty good. I might do this cut about another minute, then resharpen the tool again, 
and do it for about five minutes, resharpen the tool again, maybe spray it with water even, because that firms the fibers up, and then just con continue to contour my shape down in. And that's basically it. And after that, it's decide what kind of base I'm going to make and uh, put it together and uh, let everybody make a donation. Any questions? Any questions? Comments? Ideas? All right, you taking a break? Yeah. Take a break.